Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to something a little bit different on the channel today. This weekend just gone by, in particular on the Saturday, I had the opportunity to attend the Dunsfold Wings and Wheels 2016 air show, an event held every year in the United Kingdom at the site at which the Top Gear test track results are recorded, if any of you are aware of that TV show. But there were a number of vintage World War II aircraft displays going on at the event, and I thought I would share the footage I recorded with you. And just a side note, what really made the display special was the fact that I got to meet up with a subscriber of this channel, Ilmari, and his family, and we spent the day watching the exhibits before going our separate ways. It was a pleasure, and if you're looking for particular footage, be sure to use the description of this video where I've tried to timestamp things as accurately as possible. But enough from me, let's get on with the footage. Good morning to you all and a very warm welcome in every sense of the word to Dunsfold Wings and Wheels 2016. Well, we've got quite a lineup, haven't we, Melvin? We have. We've got a lot of things. We have, if you look down to the left, you see uh, Peter Teichman and his wonderful P51 is getting ready to, to take off. We have the Mustang, we have the Hurricane, we have Spitfires, we have the Wildcats in their Lynxes, we have the B-25, we have the B-17, we have Jet Provost, we have the Typhoon, we have the Red Arrows, we have loads of stuff. Tomorrow we're going to have the BC-10 whirling down the runway as well. We may be getting some uh, showers this afternoon. I hope we're not going to reprise that wonderful thing we started last year, Melvin, which was oh, the umbrella wave. The umbrella wave, the Mexican wave with umbrellas. That was a lot of fun. He yeah. lied. Uh, freezing cold out there, but never mind. We're troopers, Brendan. We did it. Absolutely. In fact, so. Uh, whine. Indeed, that's the, uh, the the sound of the air rushing through the cannon or the machine gun ports, like a sort of church organ. It's very interesting, of course, we have Mustang, we have Hurricane, we have Spitfire and Bouchon, the 109, and of course, they all have Merlins, but they all sound different. So Peter, of course, from uh, Hangar 11 at North Weald, he's got uh, what we call the Fabulous Four, the P-51, the Kitty Hawk, the Hurricane, and the Spitfire. Lucky man, but it's wonderful that there are people like Peter with the enthusiasm and indeed the uh, rather deep pockets uh, to be able to continue to display these wonderful aircraft. Wonderful noise, the Hurricane, uh, sorry, the, the Mustang is uh, an aircraft that is often cited as the best fighter in World War II, very often compared with the Spitfire, it's an unfair comparison, they were slightly different generations. The Mustang was built using a lot of the aerodynamics and uh, techniques that were learnt as a result of the development of such aircraft as the Spitfire, which was sort of, you know, four or five years before. So it is a fantastic aeroplane, it had a laminar flow wing, so it was very low drag. And the less drag you have, the further you're going to go on your fuel. And it was designed as a long-range escort fighter, so it had 1,000 litres of internal fuel, which is a hell of a lot when you compare it to the little amount that the Spitfire had. And of course, Bert Stiles, who wrote that uh, wonderful poem, uh, it was found, in fact, uh, on his body. He uh, flew the B-17s and then ultimately uh, went on to fly escorts of his uh, beloved aircraft. Of course, we'll be seeing the B-17 later, uh, and that was called uh, Serenade to the Big Bird. Indeed, this aircraft is also very significant. For many years, this aircraft was uh, painted in the colours um, of Jumping Jack, but in fact is now painted in the colours it wore during World War II when it was part of the famous Tuskegee Airmen Squadron where the, the first squadrons that were entirely staffed 
by African American personnel. This aircraft was assigned to the 332nd Fighter Group of the 99th Fighter Squadron. And they were also known as the Red Tails. Now this aircraft entered combat with the 15th Air Force, uh, 15th Air Force in early 1945, based at Ramatelli Airfield in Italy and served on escort and ground attack sweeps over Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia. And she still carries the battle scars. There are repaired bullet holes on this aircraft where she took incoming fire. Her pilot was a chap called George Hardy, and he's alive and well and living in the USA, aged over 90, and Peter is getting him back this year, and hopefully he will go flying again in the aircraft that he flew during World War II. This aircraft was eventually sold off as surplus after serving in uh, an Air National Guard unit and it was sold for the relatively large sum at that time of $1,110. I have asked Peter Teichman if he would sell it to me for $1,112 and I won't tell you which choice of words he used to tell me to go away. And of course we'll be seeing uh, others uh, of his stable of the famous four later on this afternoon. big flowing figures uh, with P-51. Nice little shot there as uh, an aircraft going into gap. It just crosses behind the P-51 there. On the turn. Power out of the fuel. The supercharger on the Allison wasn't that brilliant, over about 15,000 feet and dogfights were getting higher. But somebody had come up with a bright idea of making a Merlin that had much more supercharged capability and someone had the bright idea of nailing it on the front end of a Mustang. And the P-51D was the classic Mustang that had the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. One hundred and two days later, the prototype Mustang was rolled out and it flew shortly after that, just inside the three-month limit. Could do 437 miles an hour at 25,000 feet and had a range of 1,850 miles if it had two 75-gallon drop tanks. So you can see how murky it is at uh, the lower levels now, the aircraft just disappearing into the mist, slow level, but coming back in now quite clearly from the left. High speed run. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen, the classic victory roll, so much frowned upon, of course, by station commanders uh, during the war, the reason being, of course, uh, that the pilots didn't know what battle damage they'd suffered having come back from a sortie. But against that, of course, was their not... It's, it's understandable, I think, their, their enthusiasm because they were pumped full of adrenaline. 
Uh, they were on a high. We're going and in and out of the signing tent. Go and get your program signed and have a chat to the pilots. I expect Peter will be over there at uh, a point later on. Incidentally, you mentioned he's got his hurricane later on. We had a real first world problem today. Peter's hurricane's gone uh, unserviceable. So he's had to go and borrow somebody else's. Now, I mean, it's not often you can say, oh, excuse me, old chap, could I borrow your could hurricane? I borrow? So who's he borrowing a hurricane from? He's got the hurricane from Biggin Hill Heritage Hangar. Has he borrowed uh, Oh, he has. I've managed to say that without half a glass of wine gums. Yep. So he's disappeared out. Oh, he's out there. It is quite hazy today. Very sort of warm and hot and inversions and stuff. So one of the reasons for the long down wind is... But of course the turn is so that you can see around that great big long sort of, was it 10 foot of Merlin that sits in front of him? Absolutely. Nicely lined up. And voila, there he is, nice tail down landing. Indeed, you can uh, have a look on, um, you know, Google is your friend. Google the um, Hangar 11 collection. Have a look at it. There's some great histories on his aircraft. He also has another Spitfire being done at the moment. Um, and, uh, as we say, does a great job and great supporter to a lot of air shows. Well, so as he taxis back, you can see the grey big bubble canopy early. See, that's the problem. When you're flying a fighter, it's the one that's behind you, so rearwards vision is very important. So they cut down the fuselage, gave the aircraft a little bit more of a dorsal fin, and put that great big blown canopy on so the pilot could see around. So, a very elegant start to proceedings there from uh, Peter Deichmann, the P-51. And next up, Melbourne, I think we've got the um, Army Air Corps Historics, but they have... Um, Lost one en route, I think. Well, not literally lost, it had a technical <laughs> problem, the engine blew up. No. Yes, this is such... A, I think it was Eisenhower said the, uh, the four things that won the war for the Allies were the two-and-a-half-ton truck, the bulldozer that managed to make many an airfield out of rough ground, the Jeep, and the DC-3. The DC-3 supplied the Allies, it dropped parachutists, this very aeroplane did that. This aeroplane has a wonderful service history, it is a warbird, it's not just a, uh, it's not masquerading in military colours, this one did it. So essentially it's, it's a military version of the DC-3 airliner which first flew in 1935. goes back a little bit further. In the early days of all metal stressed skin aircraft, Boeing made the Boeing 247 for United Airlines and they promised to keep supplying United and no one else until the contract was finished. Uh, TWA wanted something that was all metal and so Douglas developed the DC-1, stood for Douglas Commercial 1. It was pretty successful so they ordered a whole bunch as the Douglas DC-2 which was 18 seat slightly smaller aircraft, it's just general all-round goodness made for a very successful military aeroplane. Over about 11,000 of these were built. And aptly called, I think, the Skytrain, the C-47. Yeah, of course. And under the Lend-Lease program, uh, there were large-scale deliveries of this aircraft uh, into the UK. Uh, nearly 2,000 uh, known in RAF service being delivered. First entered service uh, with the RAF actually in India. An interesting little quintessential nugget hewn from the rock of aviation history uh, in 1942. This particular one was delivered to the RAF at Netheraven in 1944, shortly before, and shortly before the end of the war, transferred to 436 Squadron at Down Ampney, and uh, took part in the Arnhem D-Day landings, and post-war this aircraft took part in the Berlin airlift. 
Yep, a tactical transport aircraft. Um, it carried troops, it carried freight, uh, airdrop supplies and paratroopers, it towed gliders, it was used for Kazovac, and of course it was legendary. And you can see looking at it, uh, an elegant aircraft, it was legendary for its ruggedness. I know I've told this story here before, but apparently on the Berlin airlift, one was having trouble maintaining height and speed on its way into Tempelhof. And when it landed, the landing was pretty terrible, so they grabbed the pilot to have a, a quiet word in his shell-like. And it turned out they'd actually loaded it with the load for an RAF York rather than the Dakota. And it had flown with about two and a half times the load it should have done, but it still managed to get there. Amazingly rugged airframe, so it has no fatigue life. The wing is held on by close to 300 bolts on a flange joint around the skin. It's a wonder, it's just rugged, it's dependent. 29-cylinder air-cooled radial piston engines, 1,100 horsepower each. Although, of course, you then moved on to the uh, 1830s in the bigger versions. I think that's correct, isn't it? Uh, the twin yep. wasps. Yeah, some of them. Uh, 1,200 horsepower yeah. with three-bladed Hamilton standard props. Andrew Dixon flying it today, I think. Is it really? Yeah, he knows his way around these. The aircraft flew for the first time on December the 17th, 1935, which is 32 years to the day after the Wright brothers. So that is a wonderful exa example of how progress has gone on in just 32 years. Nowadays it takes 32 years to design the video screen that's in the seat in front of you when you travel on an Airbus. Cruises at 200 miles an hour, I think, which is uh, quite impressive. Uh, there we are, just coming up to the promised sedan, Peter Teichman, who was flying his P-51 earlier on, and no doubt he'll be in the pilot's tent, ladies and gentlemen, so do uh, uh, go over there, uh, and I think we've got a signing place, have we not, Melvin? We have, there's a pilot signing tent, and I'm sure he'll be over there at some point. And is that just behind the commentary? Uh, quite pro probably. Past, he says, have a question on sport. Okay. That's a very interesting question, I wish I knew the answer. So coming in towards us from the right, we have Andrew Dixon in the Aces High uh, C-47. This aircraft, of course, has its invasion stripes under the wing. These were designed to prevent Allied gunners shooting down the wrong airfield, aircraft, if only it had worked. Also, again, as part of its uh, just amazing abilities, it could uh, work up to 23,000 feet of altitude and a climb rate of over 1,000 feet per minute. So I think that's pretty impressive, Melvin. Oh, it is, and there are some wonderful... If you have never... I, if I, I'd managed to miss the... Uh, T5, JP, Jet Provost, and then it will be the Blades. So quite a contrast there, uh, solo jet trainer, and into the Blades formation aerobatics. Well, one of the reasons for keeping the tail up on landing is that it means the fuselage is not blanking the rudder and you get better directional control. Something I learned all about in the rear wing. And in fact, you did too, didn't you? Yeah, yes, indeed. But uh, in fact, yes, as I say, um, and I have done it, you can land them tail down, particularly when they're heavy. Oh, it's a great big rudder. It's a lot there. easier. There's a lot of, yeah. lot of uh, yeah. airflow over there. And it gives you an idea how relatively short you can get in. Of course, some of them were used for um, doing uh, drops and pickups of agents. They would go into fields. Nice short fields. landing, too. It was, yes. He only just passed where he'd started up to <laughs> taxi out. So, just a very, very impressive aircraft. And really, again, Mel. I'm sure somebody will send a notation with the current combat aircraft, the Lockheed Martin F-16. With a whistle of those de Havilland engines. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen, if you look to your left, the pair of vampires. Get your cameras ready, a great tracking shot here. Very, very pretty little aeroplanes. And they have considerable performance as well, as you will no doubt see. Again, tricycle undercarriage. Noisy, of course, 
with characteristic wind booms. Also, you notice both aircraft have drop tanks. Uh, early jet engines, as we said, with the jet propellers were really very thirsty, so you needed to squeeze as much fuel as you can. And um, these aircraft, you will notice that, like the commentators, one is slightly more rotund than the other. There is the silk-like Japanese racing snake of Mr. Brendan O'Brien and the slightly portlier Melvin Hiscott. We have a single and a two-seater, one with a widened cabin to take the two seats. The silver disappearing almost against the murk in the background. Now the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron was founded in 2008 and is based at Riga Air Force Base in Norway, Europe, and educate people in aviation and the important role these vintage aircraft played. They have that sort of characteristic. Nice tight formation. Good photo shot here. Until it was acquired by a French owner. Until it flew, it flew for a couple of years until it was sold to Sweden. Krista Anskar uh, bought it in May 2011 and it's now operated by the historic uh, squadron based near Oslo in southern Norway. And it's wearing the markings of Vampire PXK who served with 336 Squadron in the early 1950s. <laughs> Interestingly enough, those squadron numbers were actually taken over from the RAF squadrons from World War II. Now just a uh, remark, a very, very nice formation that way. The two-seater is a little bit younger. Six were imported to Norway and in use from 1952 to 55. This, these are two-seaters, are they? So the single-seater and the two seater. Yeah. There's a thin one and a fat one. The two-seater was built in... Uh, Now the Vampire was de Havilland's first jet fighter and spawned several other twin boom fighters. Of course, it was followed into service by the Venom, which was an enlarged version with a, a different redesigned wing. And then ultimately they had that great big all-weather naval fighter, the twin boom Sea Vixen, that we were hoping to have today, but unfortunately it has a flat. Nice line of stern there, excellent. It's interesting to note that the tailplane, the tailplane on the single seater is fully contained within the booms, but there's an extension either side on the uh, on the two seater, uh, obviously due to the extra length of the two seater nose. So we're putting on entertainment for the evening, and that is, I think it's a brilliant idea. I'd love to have seen that at shows years ago when I was stuck in car parks for what seemed like weeks. But, uh, so hang around and see what's on site. It's, it's a wonderful place to be. As we said, very, very historic aircraft. There's some wonderful things. Of course, the rather great and wonderful pilot Neville Duke used to live just over in the house by Compass Gate. And uh, we can see the, uh, the uh, Islander there uh, starting to uh, taxi out and just over the top, the first of the vamps coming in. I think the Islander is an interesting aeroplane, isn't it? It's, it's one of those aircraft where... Twin engine Tiger, um, basically Piper Cub. Yes, it's, it's um, a small Dakota. Uh, was it eight seat or six seat? 
and uh, good little feeder airline, um, uh, very, very easy to fly, rugged aeroplane. So as the two-seater goes past, have a look at that length of nose. Well, my single seat list, I think, well, when yeah. I, I must try and oh, get me my too. butt oh, me in too. a vampire, yes. I like to do that. I mean, before I get my butt in a vampire, I've got to get my butt smaller. <laughs> ah, my friend with a tendency to bon bon bon. So they're saying the, the Islander was a great success. Um, still being built, Roland. Um, used by the army, both as the Islander and as the defender, the armed version. <laughs> and I mean, they're being, uh, you know, fuselages, uh, old ragged being taken and being completely rebuilt, as if from new by Britain. Or. They are, yes. Those little engines have a serious whine, don't they? They Ooh, do. Fingers in ears, folks. For the little ones, visit Sitza, which has interactive entertainment, competitions and prizes. Martin? Mile 90.
back to 1957 when the historic aircraft flight was formed at Biggin Hill with one Hurricane and three Mark 19 Spitfires, this being one of them. In October 1957, which I have to say was a very good time. you get to know the aircraft, it was really easy to fly, and a pure delight. I never tired of flying the Spitfire, you could ask it to do anything, it never disappointed me. I liked it because it was like driving a racing car, you didn't get into the Spitfire, rather you put one on, so to speak. because of the extra horsepower from the great big 250,000 uh, horsepower engine in the uh, Griffin engine in the Mark 19, that has a five-bladed uh, propeller. And some later Spitfires had a cut-down rear fuselage, like we saw earlier on the Mustang, to give better rearward view. Jeffrey Quill, the test pilot of the Spitfire, threw them, he went back into the RAF, threw Spitfires during the back of the room, and realised that rear visibility was a problem, and he suggested looking into a bubble canopy, and that was eventually done. <laughs> It's over there from, uh, usually I think from Norfolk or something like that, or North Wheel. Unfortunately those stopped when one of the flight Spitfires had an engine failure and landed on a cricket pitch in Kent. Um, and that aircraft is now in the San Diego Aerospace Museum and still has the dents in the leading edge from the cricket, uh, cricket stops. Now with your, your, your knowledge, it's designed to be a long range aeroplane. The Spitfire Mark II that you see there has just 85 gallons. It has about an hour and a half, hour and three quarters fuel. The Mark 19 was built with an all-wet wing. There were fuel tanks in the leading edge, fuel tanks all over the place, fuel tanks behind the cockpit, designed to give it much more range. And these aircraft will do photo constant missions all the way to Berlin and back. once commented on how maneuverable the Spitfire was by saying there was no such thing as a slow roll in a Spitfire because you only had an hour and a half fuel. Well, during the 
fan of Britain, though, and of course the Spitfire. A lot of glory. A hurricane, in fact. Uh, not great at number. It did, but and, uh, it's interesting that although it's a complicated aeroplane to build, at the time the factory was set up to produce that, it would have been let go because the drag would uh, just meet the, the power curve, yeah. the exponential. Uh, drag increases at the square of the speed, so if you go twice as fast, you get four times the drag. Oh, look nice, Tom Simon. Through the air. This was also found on its successor, the Typhoon. That was powered by a massive Napier Sabre engine. And both ended up doing a lot of very, very valuable ground attack work. And both served throughout the war, the rest of the war. Hurricanes did sterling service in the Far East, Middle East, the desert. They had all sorts of weapons hung into and onto the wings. They had 20mm cannon, they had 40mm anti-tank cannon, they had rockets, they had bombs, they had all sorts of things. in Dunstall history too. They were never actually based here as squadrons. But British Aerospace, at Hawker Sidley as it was originally, retained the last Hawker Hurricane ever built. Uh, one that flies with the Battle of Britain Memorial flight to this day, PZ-865. And that was used as... Uh... Also, we saw the, uh, the radiator and oil cooler under the wing on the Spitfire, of course on the Hurricane. You have that bathtub, effectively, underneath the fuselage, which is very reminiscent of the Hawker Fury. When the Hurricane was built, it was originally known as the Monoplane Fury. The Fury biplane was the RAF's first flight set capable of exceeding 200 miles an hour. A very elegant, very pretty aeroplane. And the Hurricane is really its bookshelf with a younger brother. Wonderful stuff. 
sight and wonderful sound of it. Absolutely, and such a successful aeroplane. It really was a very, very good aeroplane. Great um, uh, carrying capacity. Heavy to fly, I believe, but um, very manoeuvrable. Very capable of doing everything it should have been doing. Famous for some pretty remarkable operations. Indeed, there was the Doolittle Raid, I mean, off ships. 16 of them off the USS Hornet, led by General Doolittle. They went on to, oh, went on to bomb mainland Japan and then supposedly crash land in China. And used in every theatre, and used right up until the 1950s. And some are in service as troop transports right into the 1960s. Engine, but it's very much a goal or inverted, well it's goal wing isn't it? So you have the centre section drips down to meet the fuselage. Sorry, I'm going to correct myself, it's inverted goal wing. This leaves the engines a little bit higher than they would have been normally so that you can get a bigger propeller on them. As you see there, what great maneuverability this aeroplane has. Now the aeroplane today has been flown by Rob Rickhoff and uh, Gerard Bogre. We also have Paul van der Ven and Martin Weinberg. And I apologise to any Dutch people here for my terrible pronunciation. Position the tail for the tail gunner, glaze nose for bomb aimer, and also one machine gun was fitted in there. Many of them had a turret either halfway down the fuselage or just behind the cockpit, and of course there were side positions in the fuselage to shoot there as well. Yeah, in fact, a crew of six: one pilot, one co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, turret gunner, and engineer, uh, radio operator, waist gunner, tail gunner. As you say, uh, 20,000 pounds backs all that weight. That's uh, quite a heavy aircraft. I'm sorry, that's the entryway, the actual takeoff way. I thought it was a bit low, so it's quite about erected. And the two uh, right, two 692 14-cylinder air-cooled radials, 1,000, wonderful rumbling, 700 horsepower each. Crew speed of uh, 200 knots, that's 230 miles an hour, that's a good speed. And a range of 1,350 nautical miles, and a surface ceiling of nearly 25 this particular aircraft was delivered uh, as 429507 in 1945. However, it was stored until April 1958. It was eventually sold off for the grand total of $1,398. And in 10,000 uh, of these aircraft built, which is a really quite an impressive number. And over 300 of them were flown in the uh, Dutch war. Yes, it is. 1943 and uh, 1945. Probably my first flew on the 1940s, 1940, and uh, as I said, there remained the shows the Dutch were still using in 1954. It 
fact, during a display such as this, the crew consists of just two pilots uh, and one engineer. The pilot flying is mainly <laughs> struggling to fly the display speakers as accurately as possible while the uh, non-flying pilots in the operating ground here are about to power their car. There we are, ladies and gentlemen, more living history. Sally B. It's wonderful to see the B-17. Sally B, based up at Duxford, but as I am more than happy to point out, not part of the Imperial War Museum and financed entirely by donations. And that wonderful, fantastic volunteer crew that have kept her going for over 40 years. They've done a phenomenal job and kept in line by the lovely Elisa. So ladies and gentlemen, from the right, the B-17 and B-25, in commemoration of those 79,000 Allied air crew, Sally B and Serena. raise the funds for the annual for their engines and as soon as something goes you've got to replace it uh, a lot of work to be done and they do a fantastic job with six and a half thousand members of the Sally Bean Supporters Club and uh, you can join them get a hold of the uh, Sally Bean Charitable Trust or Sally Bean Supporters Club look up www.sallyb.org.uk and uh, in fact Eddie's coming over to have a word with Brendan lucky because I've just been joined by Ellie Salibo who is the one and the only person that has driven hard over many many years to keep this aircraft flying and I'm going to give the mic to you. Just tell us a little bit about what you try and do and how long you've been doing it and where and why. 40 years. Mind you I was only four when you started so that makes it quite unique. Now, if you look at Sally B now coming uh, coming across, uh, look, that is a huge aircraft. Uh, I had a very close friend called Ted White, and he uh, unfortunately was killed in Malta 30, 36 years ago now, and when he died, he left the tree to keep it flying. And this I have done with my huge big team. We have kept that line for all this time since then. We're still here and we are very proud of that achievement. For the bit, for the members, for the team, for everybody else. Thank you again. Thank you, Ellie. You have done a fantastic job. You continue to do a fantastic job. On behalf of a lot of people at air shows, thank you very much. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, um, I say that too, and I'm so glad that we uh, had Ellie here, quite a chance uh, to come and talk to us. So, Melvin, we're looking around, I'm looking for, um, ah, there's a man in a red suit over there. Oh, yeah, he'll be talking to us shortly, but meanwhile we have the B-17 still coming out. B-17 was designed as a maritime patrol bomber. America saw its threat as coming by sea. It didn't see the need for a strategic bomber to fly into other countries. So the aircraft had to be adapted and modified to be able to become uh, a bomber that flew in hostile skies. It had nowhere near the defensive armament it had later when it was first flown. It also had a relatively small bomb load. And of course the American idea of flying in tight formation with covering crossfire in daylight meant a large number of these aircraft were shot down. Of course RAF bombers were doing the nice offensive, they were flying in a loose stream at night. So less able to protect themselves by crossfire but less easy to find. Good 
perhaps as expensive to fly. This aircraft was uh, bought by Ted White back in the early 1970s. Sadly, he was lost in a crash in Malta, and that is why the inner right-hand engine cowling is in black and yellow checks, as that were the colours on the nose of his harbour, and it's in commemoration here. The B-17 such as this, the B-17G such as this, had two guns in the nose firing off either side of the transparency, two guns of that in the turret, two more guns behind the cockpit, Another two in the turret underneath, two more sticking out the sides of the fuselage, and a further two sticking out of the tail. So ladies and gentlemen, that smoke is in commemoration of the 79,000 Allied air crew that were lost over Ger uh, Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, Sally B and her wonderful supporters team. And we'll just see uh, which was the bright, uh, tail low, tail high, uh, the B-17 coming into land, but again, a great photo opportunity there, down sun. Got the aeroplane being flown by Peter Kuipers. Yeah, a little bit tail low, isn't it? Oh, but then pushing, keeping that tail up. <laughs> Typical to judge that one, Melvin. No, it's, yeah, that's a six of one and a half a dozen of the other, yeah, isn't it? I think so, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, please once again uh, give uh, Sally B and her wonderful supporters team a uh, oh, massive round of applause. Thank you. What a show. Fantastic. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the footage, and with that, that's all we've got time for for today. So if you have enjoyed the video, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to leave a like, comment, or subscribe for future videos of this type on my channel. And indeed, I should have another one concerning the War and Peace Revival show, which took place earlier on in this year. I should be uploading that in the near future. But until next time, I've been TX141, and I wish you all a pleasant day, and as always, take care, and good luck in the skies.